Good morning. It is week four of summer semester. This is actually just about halfway point, believe it or not. Uh, next week is the midterm, and it's time to start also considering your research essay and which museum you're going to go and review. The summer semesters, they go by quicker than you can ever imagine. Today, there's only one video, and it's on ancient Greece, but it's going to be a little bit of a longer one, so just you know, sit back, relax, and follow along with me if you don't mind. I want to start with the earliest Greek civilizations. What we think of as the Greeks today, uh, they came along over time. It wasn't overnight, hey, we're going to be Greek. And there are two older civilizations that you have to know about. One is called the Minoans, the other is called the Mycenaeans. Uh, the Minoans, they're going to live on the island of Crete, which is like 30 something miles south of. The Greek mainland, and they're named after this mythical king named King Minos. Uh, sometime around 1650 BC, the island of Crete is flourishing. The people have been there for since the New Stone Age period, the Neolithic period, and almost everything we know about them is from archaeology. We cannot completely understand their language. Their language has never been deciphered. So we have no idea what they wrote, even though they left examples of it. We know that they have a palace-based culture. Uh, the island of Crete was dotted with a number of palaces, the most important palace being in the city of Knossos. And because that's where the largest of the palaces was, we think that the city of Canossus was probably their political and their economic center. The Minoan society, uh, we're pretty sure that there was a king who controlled everything. Uh, there were nobles underneath him. And then if we had followed every other group of people we've seen up to this point, the king's going to be at the top, then the nobles, and they're going to govern the lives and tell the people what to do on the island. So that includes like farmers, sailors, shepherds, artisans. All of them were probably under control of the king. The tools and the weapons of my nobles were made primarily of copper and tin. And that copper and tin had to come from somewhere else. And that's important because it tells us that they were a trading civilization. They went and traded goods with people in the surrounding areas. The society was wealthy overall for the, for the uh, most part. It looks like they lived in peace. There aren't a lot of weapons found. There's no fortifications around the palaces. There's no walls around the cities. But if you think about it, being on an island itself, that's a pretty good protective barrier all on its own. Now the Minoans, we know they established a number of trading posts throughout the Aegean Sea and along the Eastern Mediterranean Sea. And during these trading expeditions, they come into contact with a group called the Mycenaeans. Uh, the Mycenaeans, they lived on the southern part of the Greek mainland. And we don't know a lot about them either. We don't know where they came from. Uh, they actually speak a language in the Indo-Aryan family, meaning that the language of the Mycenaeans is related distantly to the language we speak today. And by 1650 BC, they're established along what's called the Peloponnesus Peninsula in the city of Mycenae. And the city of Mycenae is going to be a major trading center. Mycenae is also the capital city of the legendary king Agamemnon, and that's the same Agamemnon that you might have heard of if you are familiar with the Trojan War. Now the story in the archaeology tells us that just like in Crete, uh, in the kingdom of the Mycenaeans, the kingdom was ruled by the king and there were some nobles. The kings had palaces, but a big difference between the Minoans and the Mycenaeans the Mycenae wall, uh, palaces has walls around it. 
Uh, the Mycenaean economy, there's the division of labor. Basically, the nobles and the kings had tight control on what the people did below. And everybody worked according to the orders of the king and according to the orders of the nobles. Now, the Mycenaeans and the Minoans, they traded regularly with each other, and we have evidence that for at least 200 years, the Mycenaeans and the Minoans were in contact with each other. The Mycenaeans and the Minoans were doing business with each other. But for whatever reason, sometime around 1450 BC, the Mycenaeans attacked the island of Crete. They destroy many of the Minoan palaces, and they capture the one at Knossos which is another reason we think Knossos was the capital. Uh, for the next 50 years, from 1450 to 1400 BC, the Mycenaeans are going to rule the island of Crete, but then there's another uprising, another wave of violence. The city of Knossos is destroyed, and much of the island is just left in ruins. Now, the Mycenaeans are going to take advantage of the Athens of the Minoans, they're going to expand their trade networks. They're going to come, take over and become the primary trading civilization of the early Greek islands. And for whatever reason, somewhere around 1200 BC to 1100 BC, uh, the Mycenaean civilization starts to fall apart. Now, it was thought that once upon a time, there was a group of people called the Dorians to attack the Mycenaeans, but more recent research has discovered that the Mycenaean civilization probably destroyed itself from the inside. Now that brings us to what's called the Dark Age of Greece. And this period, it's about a 300 year period, 1100 BC to 800 BC. And this is really where the Greek people become the Greek people. And it's called the Dark Ages of Greece because there was a period of poverty and this period of backwardness that happens after the Mycenaean Empire falls. There's this loss of literacy, there's this constant fear, and because of the uncertainty that happens, a lot of changes are going to happen with the way the Greek people operate. One of the biggest changes is going to be there's a lack of writing. And the lack of writing is going to make it possible for the adoption of the Phoenician alphabet. The Phoenician alphabet is going to be adapted to become the Greek alphabet. And then the Greek alphabet, of course, is going to be adapted even further to be the alphabet we use today. If this dark age of Greece hadn't happened, there's no telling what form of alphabet we'd be using right now. This is also known as the Homeric age or the age of Homer. Because once again, things are not written down. So it's all about oral tradition. And the stories, the Iliad and the Odyssey are passed down from generation to generation. And because they're oral traditions, it means that the story changes ever so slightly every time it was told. And probably the most important development of this time period is the polis or the city state. You've probably heard of places like Indianapolis or Annapolis. The word polis is at the end of those. Now, what was a polis? It's not just a city. It's more like a modern day county. Uh, for example, here in Carroll County, you have the city of Carrollton, you've got the city of Villa Rica, you've got the city of Mount Zion, so on and so on. But it's all Carroll County. Now, if you compare that to ancient Greece, uh, you would have the city of Athens. Athens would be like Carroll County, except for Carrollton, you put the city of Athens there. The city of Mount Zion would be another village or community. The city of Rootville would be another community. But the city of Athens is the main city-state, and that's what the city-state gets its name for. Now these city-states or these polis, they are this compact group of people. So all the people who live in Athens are going to have a similar culture, a similar way of life, and they're gonna have similar laws. 
And those laws may or may not be the same or similar to the laws of their neighboring city state. It'd be like if Carroll County had a one set of laws and Douglas County's laws were completely different. It all has to do with the community you live in, the people, people you live around and what those people need. Now, even though that's a small compact group, they've got these similar cultures and similar laws, there's some good and there's some bad that comes with it. Uh, for one thing, the good, uh, you feel secure. You know your place in life. You know where you belong. But the downside is it's really hard, in some cases nearly impossible, to move from one city state to another. If you've ever been the new kid in school and you've had to go to a different school, it's very, very uncomfortable. You don't know what's going on. You don't feel like you belong. Um, this is that feeling on steroids. There are also some similarities with the way that the city-states or the polis are all set up. For one, the polis is going to have something called a, a acropolis. An acropolis is going to be a hill or the most defendable place in the city or in the city-state. Um, the most famous, of course, is the acropolis in Athens, which is where the Parthenon sits. The Acropolis is kind of like the last place of refuge. It's the last stand if the city's under attack. And usually there are going to be stone or wooden steps that are constructed to make it easy to get to the top. There's usually going to be access to drinking water. And then eventually it's going to become the place where temples and other religious structures are kept. Next. Each city has an agora. Now, the agora is basically a meeting place. It's a wide open space. It was originally where the warriors met, but over time it's become the place where the people meet. And that means that the agora is really the political center of the city. Public meetings happen there, a uh, number of shops, public buildings, courts, all of that is going to be done at the agora. Now, next to the Agora is going to be an area set aside for dancing, an area set for, aside for celebrations, and very often this area next to the Agora is where you're going to find the, the theater. Now, surrounding the polis, this would be like the farmland. This is the, all that land that's outside of the city. Uh, you're going to get pasture land, which primarily was sheep and goats at the time. Only the wealthy had cattle, only the wealthy had horses. So uh, you've got the farmland where people grow the food. Uh, you got the vineyards where people grow the grapes. You got the pasture land for the sheep and the goats. But then you also have the wasteland. The wasteland is not where all the garbage went. The wasteland, that was where the quarries were and the mines were. So you would quarry stone, you would mine precious metals. And depending on time of year, the, the um, sheep and the goats might go there to graze in addition. Now, there are several types of governments that are used. One of them is the traditional monarchy, where there is a king. But then there's something called an aristocracy. That's when the wealthy are going to rule. Very closely related is an oligarchy, which is the rule of just a few. That's usually a small group of wealthy citizens, not necessarily all the aristocracy. Then there's democracy. Very often when we think of ancient Athens, democracy is what we think of. But in reality, democracy is fairly rare. And it's all citizens without respect for birth or wealth who are going to be able to participate. And when we say all citizens, we're really just talking about land or property owned by males. Last but not least is tyranny. Uh, usually when we think of a tyrant today, we think of something bad, but tyrant in ancient Greece, it just meant somebody who seized power unlawfully. Sometimes they were good, sometimes they were bad. And now each of the polis has its own group of soldiers called poplites. 
And I've got some pictures here of hoplites. Now, hoplites are usually going to be some sort of middle class farmer that provide their own weapons, their own equipment. Now, for armor, they're going to have helmets, breastplates, shin guards, and a little round shield. And for weapons, short sword, and a nine foot long spear. And all total, when you take the armor and the weapons into consideration, their equipment is going to weigh 50 to 60 pounds, which is pretty similar to what soldiers today have to wear. Now, for the weapon, their primary weapon is not the short sword, it's actually the nine foot long spear. And the reason for that is because of the way they fight. They fight in a phalanx formation, which can be up to a thousand men long and up to 20 men deep. And there are overlapping shields, which turns this pretty much into a moving wall. And it's a moving wall that has spears jabbing out of it. Now, each polis is usually going to be independent, but sometimes the Greeks band together to create these leagues of city-states. And this gave way to this idea of Greek federalism, basically a political system where several states form a central government while remaining independent of the, to maintain their own affairs. So it's like they all cooperate, they, work, they all work together, there's a larger government at work, but each of the individual city-states still has control over their date and the operation. After the Dark Age ends, we have what's called the Lyric Age, and it's about a 300-year period as well. You know, the Greeks are going to start this overseas expansion. They basically recovered from the breakdown of the Mycenaean collapse. They've grown wealthy, they've grown in numbers, and this new prosperity is going to bring new problems to Greece. Uh, for one, Greece is not exactly a large and fertile country. So there's a lot of families that have very little land. There's a lot of families who have no land at all. And there are some families who just don't have food. Uh, you, you combine that with this desire for a new start, this love of excitement and adventure, and natural curiosity too, and the Greeks start to expand. And because the Greeks are so good at traveling on the sea, uh, they're basically going to turn the Mediterranean Sea into a giant Greek lake. So you have Greeks settling in what is today Italy, modern day Greece, in Turkey, the Holy Land, uh, Israel, Syria, Jordan, and then Egypt and along North Africa as well. One of the big reasons they're able to spread to all those places, and quite frankly, just a similar climate to what they're used to. And because all these Mediterranean regions are pretty similar, it makes it easy for them to establish new colonies. And very often these new colonies look exactly like the old cities that they've left behind. So with this expansion of colonies and with this expansion of Greek civilization, uh, Eastern culture and Egyptian culture really begin to mix into this unique Greek culture. Now let's talk about Sparta for a moment. And I've got a picture here of where Sparta is compared to Athens. Uh, Sparta is all about warfare. That's the only way I can put it. Everything about their society is geared toward war. It goes all the way back to 735 BC. The Spartans set out to conquer their neighbors, the Messinians. And Messinia is this fertile region of farmland in the southwestern Peloponnesus. And this right here is considered the Peloponnesus. This island if you will, that's connected with just a little piece of land. So 735 BC, the Spartans go to war against their neighbor Messenia. The war lasts for 20 years, and eventually the Spartans are going to win. The Spartans then take all of the Messenian land, turn it into 
part in the held territory. And all of the slaves, or all of the people in the city are going to be turned into slaves known as helots. Somewhere around 650 BC, the helots are going to rebel against the Spartans, and this leads to this bloody 30-year war that ends in Spartan victory. But the fighting is so brutal that Sparta needs to take a break from the fighting. Now, following the war, the commoners of Sparta demanded equality, and the commoners are agitated. The commoners disrupt Spartan society so much that the nobility agrees, hey, let, let's remodel this government. And these reforms that are created are known as the Lycurgan reforms. And there's a new political system, a new social system, and a new economic system that is created from this. Now, arguably, one of the most important things that happens is that uh, political distinctions amongst the Spartans are eliminated. All people become legally equal. There's no more aristocracy. It's more of an oligarchy. The government's formally led by two kings or two war leaders. There's a council of 28 elders who control all the military and foreign policy decisions. And then all the domestic affairs are handled by five overseers who are elected from and elected by the people. Economically, the Spartans are going to divide the land of Messenia amongst all citizens. The helots are going to work the land, and the helots are going to provide the food for the Spartans. Under the reforms of Lycurgus, the, uh, if you're a Star Trek fan, uh, the, weeds of, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. In other words, the good of the state is more important than your individual feelings. Uh, family life is sacrificed to the polis. The police will oversee the upbringing of the children, and it was the government council, not the father, who will determine whether or not an infant is going to be allowed to live. Boys from the age of seven live in herds, and the system of training was called the agog, or agog. And it's carefully planned that the government will take over the raising of the, the young boys because they want to weaken the family ties and have these future warriors feel that Athens was the most important thing. All adults were responsible for the behavior of children. All adults have the right to punish or discipline their children and not just their offspring. Oh, and I should mention also that military service is compulsory from age 12 and up. Now, Spartan womanhood is interesting also. As young girls, Spartan women, they lead rigorous lives that keep them physically fit. And that's because the Spartans felt that healthy women give raise to healthy boys. Spartan women, they were allowed to move freely about the city, but rather than being secluded in the home, um, they can go out and see friends. Spartan women, they don't marry at puberty, which was the custom of most Greece, but instead marriage is put off and childbearing or pregnancy is put off until around 18 or 20 years old. Now that might sound like they're, you know, forward thinking with women's rights, but in reality, uh, they were worried about the mother's health. Healthy mom raises healthy kids. Marriage was by capture. In other words, the girl is kidnapped, carried off, her hair is cut, she's dressed as a boy by her bridesmaid. After that happens, she's put into a dark room where her husband-to-be would visit her and have his way with her, if you get what I'm saying. Basically, the mother-to-be or the bride-to-be is raped. If pregnancy results, the marriage is considered valid. Now, even after marriage, the husbands have to live together in basically a barracks or a mess hall until they reach the age of 30. And they only get to visit their wives at night with permission or secretly and stealthily. And one reason given for this was to uh, basically heighten sexual attraction and increase the likelihood of, of pregnancy. 
Another reason they did it this way is it kept the couple from developing these strong mm, emotional and mental bonds because everybody was supposed to serve the state. Their personal needs were separate. Second, the husband was It was okay for a husband to loan his wife to his friends. If the husband feels like he has enough kids, he can give his woman to one of his friends. And then the friend can sleep with the woman, the woman can get pregnant, et cetera, et cetera. It's uh, kind of disturbing. And just in general, the, the Spartan woman is expected to raise three sons to adulthood. And to do that, usually meant that you had to have 12 or so children. Now at all times, the husband or the eldest male of the household will control what the wife does and doesn't do. So Spartan culture is gonna lack a lot. Um, everything, like I said, is war-based. Their food is war-based, their procreation, their food, just everything about them is geared towards war. Now the counterpoint to Sparta is of course Athens. And Athens is located right here on what's known as the Attican Plain. Now Athens, it faced the same social and economic issues as Sparta did, but it evolved very differently. And eventually it's going to uh, evolve to uh, democracy. Now, sometime around 630 BC, there's this Athenian aristocrat named Cylon who attempts to seize control of the city and become a tyrant. Uh, his efforts are not successful. Cylon himself escapes, but most of his supporters are killed. Now, in response to Cylon's attempts, another Athenian aristocrat named Draco is going to be asked to establish the first law code of the Athenian polis. Now, the draconian code is quite harsh. It's said to have been written in blood. It really gave proof to the idea that the city belonged to its people. That's where the word draconian comes from. Draconian means like overly hard, overly punished. A lot of the punishments in Draco's Law just ended in death. Now, there's a lot of peasant unrest over the next century. Peasants weren't happy with the rules, they kept rising up. And much of the unrest stemmed from the fact that all economic matters were controlled by members of the assembly. And the assembly was run by the aristocrats of the polis. And because most of the best farmland was owned by the aristocrats, common farmers, they're going to struggle to survive. And they often go into debt just to get their daily needs met. Now, this debt forced many farmers into the economic dependence of the aristocrats. Like, for example, a farmer who owed a debt was forced to pay up his land as collateral and then hand over a sixth of his annual crop as well until the debt was paid. Now, if the farmer can't pay the debt, then he pledges himself and his family as collateral. If he could not pay that debt, then he and his family became slaves of the creditor. And in most cases, a farmer who went into debt would be able to produce enough to support his family, but just not enough to support paying off the debt. And that would mean that you're gonna go into slavery. And very often these farmers would leave, they would go into exile rather than allowing themselves to be sold into slavery. The problem with the peasants gets so bad that another aristocrat named Solon is going to be asked to fix the issue. And Solon, he used his writings to oppose this debt system, this slavery system. And he was respected by both aristocrats and the common people so much that in 594 BC, he was elected as the chief magistrate or the chief judge of Athens and then given extra powers to reform the government. Now, Solon, he's immediately going to free all the people who are enslaved for debts. He recalls all the exiles who had left Athens. They basically invite them back home. 
He's going to cancel all the debts on land and make being enslaved for debt illegal. Now, beyond that, he's also going to divide society into four different uh, legal groups, and it's all going to be based on wealth. The most influential group has the wealthiest citizens, the poorest group has the poorest citizens, and depending on which of those legal groups you fall in, depends on how your punishment is doled out or what type of fine you have to pay. Now, eventually, the, the system that is formed by Solon will, will fall. In the year 50, 546, a tyrant named Pisistratus will take over. And this is one of those things where being a tyrant wasn't necessarily bad. Um, Athens is very successful under Pisistratus. And Pisistratus is going to promote the idea of equality. And that leads us to Cleisthenes. Cleisthenes is the one who, around 500 BC, rewrites the constitution of Athens so that power is given to an elected assembly and that all males are allowed to be citizens, all males are allowed to participate in election. And all males are allowed to um, serve in the assembly. Another thing that Cleisthenes does is he comes up with this idea of ostracism. Basically, ostracism was a 10 year exile from, from your town. And if you were ostracized, you still kept all of your belongings and everything, but you couldn't come back for 20 or for 10 years. Now, once you came back after 10 years, everything you owned was still yours. So uh, you got to keep what you lost. Now, there are a couple of different wars that I talk about. Uh, one of them is the Persian War. Persian War is going to start in 490 BC when the Persian Empire attacks the city of Athens. Athens, along with Sparta, will defeat the Persian Empire at the Battle of Marathon. But 10 years later, the Persians are going to come back. And they're going to come back with an army of over 150,000 men. Now, this is where the Battle of Thermopylae happens. The Battle of Thermopylae is where the movie 200 takes place. And although the Greek people will eventually lose, this defense at the Battle of Thermopylae allows the Spartan and Athenian military to regroup and eventually in the war. We also have the Peloponnesian War. That happened in 431 BC. And that's really going to be a war between Athens and Sparta over control of the society. Now, over the next seven years, the army of Sparta and its Peloponnesian allies will invade Athens in the Attican plain five times. Each time, the people of Athens close the walls to their city. They repel each attack. But eventually, the people within Athens will get tired of their cramped conditions, and they will open the door to the city. Now, 421, the Athenians, they're, they're worried of losing so much. Uh, and the Spartans, they, they, the Athenians and the Spartans, they reach a stalemate. And a peace treaty known as the Peace of Nicias is signed. And this isn't an actual peace treaty. It's more like just a, a ceasefire while both sides reload. In 413 BC, the peace between Athens and Sparta breaks down. Sparta is going to declare war on Athens 
And if Athens will be defeated along with its allies by Sparta, Corinth, and a group of people known as Thebes. Now, what was life like in classic Athens? This is the Hellenic world. This is what we think of most often when we think of ancient Greece. One thing, this is where our, our concept of history begins. Uh, there is a gentleman named Herodotus. He's considered the father of history, and he wrote a book called The Histories. And the histories were just that, a history of the Persian War. Another gentleman named Thucydides, he writes an account of the Peloponnesian War, but it's a little bit different in that Herodotus mostly kept out the Greek gods, where Thucydides 100% kept out the Greek gods. What's important is that both of these authors, they're going to try and look at historical events more through uh, the interactions of humans versus humans more than the Greek gods getting involved in human activity. So history begins to be objective and fact-based during this time period because of both Herodotus and Thucydides. This is also going to be the golden age of Athens, and a lot of it is done by the leader of Athens named Pericles. Pericles lived from 495 to 429 BC, and he died during the Peloponnesian War. Now, at the time, Athens was head of something called the Delian League, and you had to pay dues to be in the Delian League, and Pericles would take money that these other city-states paid and use it to fund huge construction projects within Athens. So he builds these giant temples, these public buildings, these theaters. Pericles is the one who builds on top of the Acropolis. So the Parthenon, the Propylaea, and the Temple of Athena Nike are all built during the age of Pericles. At the bottom of the theater, or at the bottom of the Acropolis is the Theater of Dionysus. And the Theater of Dionysus was large enough that four, that uh, 9,000 students could be held inside of it, or 9,000 spectators, I should say. The people of Athens, they absolutely adore theater, and you could really consider it the national pastime. There were large competitions held each year. Uh, these plays were competitions where you could win fame, fortune, good, and quite frankly, a lot of these are, are dirty, too, because they are filled with double meanings, double entendres, and obscenity. There were very few women actors. There were very few props. There was professional chorus used, and you would oftentimes have to play different characters, and your character was determined by which mask you were holding up in front of your face. They had two main types of theater. There was the tragedy or the goat song, and it was called the goat song because whoever won that category got a goat. Then you have comos singing or comedy, and very often the comedy would happen after a late night of drinking. Now the chorus, the training of the chorus was an expensive civic duty, and it was often the wealthier citizens funding the chorus. And a lot of the Greek folk drama focused on the problems that the people of Athens faced in their daily lives. And a lot of it had to do with their politics of the day too. Greek philosophy is pretty important, and there were a couple different philosophers that you should know based with ancient Greece. One particular group of philosophers uh, were known as the Sophists. The Sophists, they tend to shun speculation, not just about God's religion, but they also ignored the physical world around them. Uh, what we call the natural sciences had no appeal to them whatsoever. 
Uh, the sophists were almost completely concerned with teaching practical skills used in government and business. They taught the arts of persuasion, they taught the arts of rhetoric, uh, some even claimed they could teach wisdom and virtue, and it was always taught to make a good bit of money. You also have Socrates. Uh, Socrates lived from 469 to 399. Uh, Socrates refused to take payment for his teaching, and he claimed that he was only wise enough to know the extent of his own ignorance. In other words, he didn't try to teach you something that he didn't know personally. He used something called the Socratic method or dialectic method. He would ask questions over and over and over again to really make you think about your beliefs and why you believed as you did. Uh, so the dialectic method or the Socratic method, it's just as much about personal reflection as it is answering questions. After him, we have Plato. Uh, Plato lived from 429 to 347 BC. And he believed that gaining wisdom and gaining knowledge came through constant study and constant questioning. The science of wisdom could only be understood if you had enough training, if you were sufficiently training, sufficient intelligence, uh, Plato basically did not like the large masses. Uh, Plato and Socrates both despised democracy. Plato even said it's the worst system of government for the people. And what Plato wanted was an enlightened despot or a benevolent dictator to rule society and Plato also believed that women should have a role in society. Then we have Aristotle, who lives from 384 to 322 BC. Aristotle, he was not really interested in developing the perfect state, the perfect society. He was more interested in creating the best practically possible society. So he's going to argue the best of the best will be those of middle talent, those of middle wealth, because they would balance out the wealthy and balance out the poor. Aristotle is also going to say that, you know what, humans are social creatures, social animals, and that their natural habitat is to be in society, and society was the city-state. Now, what about women during this classical period? You're basically a perpetual minor. You're represented by a man in all transactions. Uh, that man's either your father, your, your husband, or your old son. There's a group of people called Metics. Metics are not citizens of Athens. They're considered other. And they're allowed in the Athens. They cannot be citizens. They do have to pay taxes, and they do have to serve in the army. And then, of course, we have slaves, and slaves have absolutely no rights. Slaves can work in any occupation that the owner sees fit, and the owner can do anything that, or the owner could make the slave do anything that would make the owner money. So it's an interesting period. Uh, I should also mention that in Athens, marriage happened around the age of 13. Women are going to get married to a man that is about the age of 30. And more often than not, you're going to be getting married to your first cousin. And the reason you're going to get married to your first cousin is to try and keep as much wealth in the family as possible. Now we have Alexander the Great, and this is known as the Hellenistic world. So the world of Sparta and Athens is the Hellenic world. The world of Alexander the Great is known as the Hellenistic world. Now the Hellenistic world is going to begin uh, after Sparta defeats Athens. 
Uh, Sparta defeats Athens, and the peace, it really only lasts for a couple of years because almost as soon as the war is over, Corinth and Thebes are going to declare war on Sparta. The combined forces of Corinth and Thebes will defeat Sparta at the Battle of Lectra. And this is a turning point in Greek warfare because it's the first time in hundreds of years that something changed. Instead of fighting a fair battle where everybody has the same length, those nine foot spears, suddenly Corinth and Thebes try a longer spear and instead of running at each other directly, um, Corinth and Thebes are going to change their, their fighting style a little bit so that they actually come at angles and attack from the side. Now, watching this war play out is a guy named Philip of Macedonia. Now, Macedonia is the northern part of Greece, and the people of Macedonia were considered Greeks, but they were also considered other because they spoke a different dialect of Greek, and they drank undiluted wine, which made them borderline barbarian. Now, Philip of Macedonia is going to watch this battle. He's going to adopt some of their techniques. Uh, one thing is, instead of nine-foot spears, Philip of Macedonia is going to outfit his soldiers with 12-foot spears. And he's going to take his cavalry, his horse soldiers, He's going to form them into like a triangle wedge. He's going to run his cavalry through the enemy, scatter them all over the place, and then his phalanx infantry will come in and mop up and finish the job. Using this new way of fighting, He's going to take control of most of Greece at the Battle of Sharona in 328 BC. And really, the only place he does not take control of is Athens, because he, or not Athens, but Sparta, because he doesn't think it's worth it. The key to his military is to travel light and move fast. Now, while his army is traveling light and moving fast, his son, Alexander, is going to learn how to conduct warfare. Now, the son of Philip, technically he's Alexander III. We know him better as Alexander the Great. At the age of 18, he takes over his dad's military. He's tutored by Aristotle. He loves science. He's loved by his army because he lives like his men do, but he's, he's, he's not necessarily a, a good guy. 334 BC, he invades the Persian Empire. By 332 BC, he's conquered Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, Athens, and Israel. By 330 BC, he has taken most of Turkey, the rest of, of Jordan, parts of Iraq. Then by 326 BC, he's conquered all of Iran, Afghanistan, parts of Pakistan, and he controlled most of the known world. Eventually, his army just refuses to go any further. He's forced to turn around and go back home. And in the city of Babylon, at the age of 33, he dies. And we don't know if it was poisoning, he drank himself dead, or if it was disease. We don't even know actually where he's buried yet. But Alexander the Great, he does leave a son. The son is very young and very weak. And the son is pushed out of power by his generals. And the three primary generals of Alexander the Great are going to control and create kingdoms for themselves. Antigonus gets Macedonia. He gets Greek itself. Greece itself, I should say. Seleucus gets Syria in Western Asia and creates the Seleucid Empire. And then Ptolemy gets Egypt, which becomes known as Ptolemaic Egypt. Oh, and I should also mention that because Alexander the Great falls in love with Egypt, 
the city of Alexandria becomes the headquarters of Greek civilization. The primary, the main, the capital city, if you will, of Greece isn't even in Greece anymore. It is in northern Egypt. So how is this world different? What's different about this Hellenistic one? Well, number one, the center of Egyptian culture is in Egypt. Cities are no longer independent because Alexander has united them all. But even though they're not independent, they are still the most important city. They are still going to be the primary location that trade happens. Hellenistic culture is also going to be more focused on the individual as well as the female, the woman. It becomes okay to have women in public life. It becomes okay to have women support men openly. And before you know it, uh, Greek culture, Greek ideas, Greek religion, basically Greek society is everywhere in the Mediterranean Sea from Spain all the way to Israel and then back down around to the parts of Egypt. There's also a change in philosophy. There are two new groups of philosophers that are founded. Uh, there's the Cynics, who are founded by Diogenes of Sinope. And the Cynics, they basically, they reject all the conventions of society. Uh, Diogenes, he decides that the easiest way to be happy is to live a simple life. And Diogenes of Sinope, he's going to live actually as a beggar. And he's going to be laughed at. People are going to call him a dog. And that is where the word cynic comes from. He translates cynic to ancient Greek. It becomes the word kunikoi, which means dog-like. The Epicureans, they only believe what they can see. They're very materialistic. They're what is called empiricist, meaning whatever they believe has to be measurable by what you can see, what you can feel. And they thought the best way to be happy was to withdraw completely from public life. Uh, basically, they didn't believe in life after death. You couldn't see a soul, therefore it couldn't exist. If there's no soul, if there's no life after death, then there's no purpose of life. And the Epicureans, they wanted to avoid as much pain as they could. Now, Stoics are founded by a guy named Zeno, or Zeno. And Zeno, uh, Stoicism is almost a religion. Um, he's going to argue that, that man has to live in peace with religion. Humans must live in harmony with nature. And Stoics saw every thought, every action as being either good, bad, or indifferent. So good parts of humanity were courage, wisdom, justice, and prudence. Evil parts of man were cowardice, injustice, foolishness. And then there were these indifferent things that they couldn't control. Um, basically, your, your life, your health, your beauty, your strength, they were indifferent to those things. And strangely enough, the Stoics, they believed that passion was the root of all the evil. If somebody was too passionate, that meant that their soul had an illness. Now, even beyond this, I don't have a slide on it, but there's mystery cults too. Uh, there are cults for basically every sort of possible need. There are cults for ethical guidance, cults for comfort, cults, cults from about death. Uh, these cults all worship different gods, some of them Egyptian, some of them Greek. And Judaism was considered one of these cults, believe it or not. All right, so your midterm exam is next week. It will be available from the 29th of June all the way through the 6th of July. I will be putting out a video next week on the research essay so you have an idea of what you need to do. 
So do look forward to that once you complete your midterm exam. Make sure you do watch that. Also, if you're interested in how to prepare for the midterm, the absolute best thing I can do is tell you to go back and watch these videos. These videos and these PowerPoints I've done are going to be where the material comes from. The absolute 100% best study guide I can give you are my actual words in these actual lectures. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, please email me. It's going to be a very long week in the office this week. So entertain me with a couple emails and give me something to do. Until next time, we'll see you around. Bye-bye.